Will ethanol derived from corn help reduce our dependence on foreign oil? Many experts say yes, but only in the short term. There are long-term solutions for providing our transportation energy needs and for helping to beat prices at the pump. Rapidly growing grasses such as this miscanthus plant or algae can help provide a new generation of biofuel solutions and they offer the advantage of not requiring land that is desperately needed to grow food. Join us as scientists, business leaders, and economic experts from all over the world gather together at UC San Diego to discuss how biofuels will help meet our future transportation energy needs and also contribute to the mitigation of global warming. Now, one thing that rings in my ears in terms of, of this whole topic of uh, biofuels and the business of biofuels are the words of, of one of Silicon Valley's best known venture capitalists, John Doerr of Kleiner Perkins. And at the TED conference that was held um, in April of 2007, somebody who's been known as being one of the most hard-nosed businessmen um, in the whole venture capital world got up and told the audience, I'm really scared. I don't think we're going to make it. And what he laid out, of course, is the challenge that we're aware of in terms of climate change. But to put all of this in broadest perspective, I think it's fantastic that we're having this meeting this month here in San Diego, because a lot of the issues of climate change really started with the recognition of the work of uh, Charles David Keeling at SIO. And what he did was to, of course, set up the measurements of atmospheric CO2 concentrations at Mauna Loa. But what I just want to point to you is the Keeling curve actually turns 50 in early March, just uh, about a month from now. And of course, what we've learned from, from that type of work and, and the work of the um, Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, which of course received the Nobel Prize just recently together with Al Gore, is that these types of CO2 concentrations are largely being driven by fossil fuel burning. And of course, as many of us are aware, that fossil fuel burning and the rise in CO2 is driving with high confidence a great deal of environmental change that is potentially catastrophic for us and the rest of the planet. And so the question, of course, is what are the solutions? I think we're all here today because we want to be part of the solution. And if you look at the interest of biofuels and how they might impact in terms of transportation, I think it's important to point out that biofuels and replacing the, um, the, the portion of CO2 emissions that come from the trans transportation sector with a fuel that has a lot lower um, impact in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions is, is going to be a really important challenge for us but of course, it is also only one part of a much bigger picture in terms of the CO2 footprint you get from energy supply, industry, agriculture, et cetera. And so as we think about applying our scientific skills and our business skills to building a environmentally sound biofuels business and actually replacing transportation fuels, we really do want to put it into the context, of course, that we're going to have to be pushing on many fronts in order for us to solve this overall problem. And if we ask ourselves what sort of lead are we getting from the government, then of course the Energy Independence and Security Act has mandated that by 2022 we should be producing 36 billion gallons of renewable fuels. This is what they call the renew renewable fuel standard. Now, of course, this really is the floor and not the ceiling of the possibilities. And so things such as the billion ton vision, which we may hear more about from Chris Somerville, that we have the capability in terms of land and in terms of the application of future technologies to actually get close to replacing our, our transportation fuel use um, of, of 2006 levels by about 2025. And I think what's important for us to keep in mind that in terms of what we would like to see from the government is rather than a, a patchwork set of targets is from international governments really these targets should be stressing our overall strategy for emissions reduction um, and not only of course specific targets in different parts of the biofuel sector. Now as, as scientists and business people we're always going to be facing 
public opinion. And it might be amazing to us, of course, that Newsweek um, could, in fact, have a cover saying global warming is a hoax. But it's actually driven, of course, by some remaining public skepticism. And so I think one role that we have, so for example, just in August of 2007, 39% of people still felt that there was a problem in terms of disagreement with scientists, although perhaps encouraging science in terms of public opinion was in a BBC News poll in September. Uh, about 80% of the people in that more global representative poll were agreeing that man-made global change is here to stay. So we're going to have to play a role, both from the scientific community and the business community, in, in pushing back against this, this type of skepticism and helping people understand not only what the science is of the challenge that, that tells us with a great deal of confidence that we have catastrophic climate change, but also helping the public to understand what role we can play in terms of the science and the business behind building a biofuel industry. For me personally, I believe that these are some of the imperatives for success. We're going to, of course, need multiple feedstocks and multiple advantage molecules or biofuels molecules to really solve the transportation fuel problem. We're going to want to look at first and second and third generation fuels. We absolutely need aggressive commercialization for this to be real. It can't be solved in the academic sector. And in that respect, there was about 800 million of VC biofuel investments in 2006, and every indication is, is that's going to take off dramatically. We, of course, have to have a biofuel industry that's going to take into account environmental and economic impacts. It needs to be sustainable, and it needs to take in all of these types of issues relating to land use and the actual carbon footprint of transportation, refining, and distribution. And so I leave it up to us. This really is a situation where it is not an exaggeration to say that biofuels can change the world. And I think it's up to us and the speakers throughout this whole meeting to lay out the roadmap, to continue to lay out the roadmap for how we're going to get there. The title of uh, my talk is uh, uh, UCSD Consortium to Develop Biofuels for Microalgae. And I, I would like to say that that's more of a concept. And fundamentally, we have to make progress one project at a time. But we're in discussions with quite a few uh, different entities that could be part of such a collaborative consortium. And um, uh, nevertheless, we don't have a consortium that has a well-defined entity or structure yet. And of course, there's challenges to doing that in terms of sharing IP and, and overlap of projects and so forth and so on. So I'm not going to go into all the details of complexity of trying to create such a center, but I, I will say that, that San Diego is an outstanding region known internationally as, as, as excellent in biotech, and UC San Diego is a major top 10 U.S. research university, very strong in biology, molecular biology, and because of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography and several other coincidences, we just happen to have a relatively strong cluster of experts in algae. Personally, I think that this is a region where, where algae could be a major research um, focus. Now, we all know that there's a lot of discussion about global warming. I won't go into the details. Uh, I think it's important to point out that there still are you know, people calling this fiction, but my friend John Benjamin, who's an expert on algae, has got proof positive that there is global warming. This was <laughs> <laughs> So I, I thank John, who's not here for that. Um, and, and, and another very interesting thing, as we know, is that there are um, significant, there's significant interest in the private sector in investing in the technologies of the future that are going to help solve these problems. It's clear that we have issues. We've got climate issues, we've got strategic issues with fuel and the sources of it, the distribution of it. And, and so how are we going to solve this? Now, these are just a couple of headlines from the San Diego Union Tribune, the local paper, but any newspaper or, 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 or any uh, uh, media you look at, whether it's the television news or so forth, they're talking about investments in the private sector and how do you match that to the problem and get the right science all hooked together that's the challenge um, universities have a, a unique role we are not the private industry we're not, not the national labs uh, uh, we, we fundamentally should be educating leaders of emerging industry so let's say algae does become 
uh, a significant biofuels industry. Where are you going to educate the leaders? It's always going to be the university. So universities will always play a role. And we should be doing the basic and applied research. It's cost uh, you know, less money to do the basic research than to really do the scale up. Scale up is risky capital, and then that risk capital's you know, got to be incentivized somehow. The universities, of course, can take the long view, and it may be a really long time before algae make it, but I'm, I'm here to try to argue that maybe algae should be uh, moving forward faster than, than it is at this point. Uh, of course, maintain ob objectivity, and our, and our approach in, as scientists is to disprove hypotheses rather than to love them. And so my goal as an algae expert is to actually try to disprove that we can use algae for biofuel, but the work you do is sort of the same as if you were trying to prove it. It's just that we shouldn't be loving our, our hypothesis. Um, we also provide services, and I'll show you in a, a moment, expertise that my lab has that actually is fundamentally important to servicing um, any algae industry that does develop because the private sector doesn't have the experts. There's certain things they have to measure and know about the systems that they are trying to operate, and, and we in the universities have, have been working on this, uh, these types of methods, and, and we should be partnering with the private industry and, and government labs and so forth. Um, now, one thing I would like to point out is uh, has been raised quite a bit, and this is a slide from uh, Ron Pate at Sandia Lab. But, but water is a very important challenge for biofuels or, or agricultural crops in general. But this whole issue of food crops versus energy crops, I mean, there's a lot of evidence that maybe some of the energy crops are going to minimize water use or minimize nutrient loading or minimize the high quality land. But the, both the land and the water issues are not going to go away anytime soon when it comes to terrestrial crops. And so, you know, we really need to be looking at these things in great detail. And the one advantage of algae is that we can actually grow them on saline water or on, on um, uh, uh, you know, seawater or saline aquifers. So if you look in the United States at, at what fraction of the fresh water is used relative to precipitation, you can see that the, the desert southwest is already, you know, uh, using a large fraction of the available water uh, in, in, in irrigation. And, uh, and so, you know, eventually, as we grow our population and we grow our agriculture, these kinds of um, uh, challenges of water will become important. Uh, we all know there's no you know, magic bullet, uh, and many options must be explored. Uh, this is an interesting quote from National Geographic, where it says that, uh, discussing things with experts, that many say algae comes closer than any other plant to being a, uh, to having the, the, the chance to be a major contributor for, uh, for, for this. And um, uh, this is uh, just my uh, uh, thought. This, this is actually uh, turned out to be an internet ruse. The idea of the Rand Corporation had assembled experts to imagine the, the, computer, the home computer of the future, and this is what they thought it would look like in the year 2004. Well, I had an Osborne on my, on my desk in 1980. So it was obviously, we moved a lot faster to microelectronics than people would have thought in the mid-50s. And while this is a, a ruse, the main point is that innovation and market forces are essential. And, and in the future of energy, land, water, and climate solutions, we really need to pursue these things. And so I think that, that if we as a society really make the commitment to go after uh, solving the problems for cellulosic or for algae, I think that we can move faster and algae may play a role. So um, most people talk about algae and, and, and consider they would be perhaps a source for lipids for biodiesel. But it's important to also pay attention to the fact that algae can produce up to half their final biomass as starches that could easily go into ethanol or other pathways similar to what we're talking about here with terrestrial biomass. So algae shouldn't be excluded for all those pathways that would be based on sugars. Um, the interesting thing is that, um, uh, you know, what we're, challenge, we're challenged with food crops clearly is that we can't scale those up sufficiently. Now, non-food crops might scale up. Uh, there are all these issues about food costs, arable land, fresh water, nutrient loading, we've been hearing all about these things. I'm not gonna go into them in detail, but we do need various non-food non, non feedstocks. Of course, cellulosic, is an option, and al algae have great promise too. Um, I've, I got tired of seeing these pictures yesterday, so I thought I'd buy, this is my one, uh, you know, uh, 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 rebuttal to all the, 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 the slides I saw yesterday about how great miscanthus is. Algae can produce 10 tons per acre per year of biodiesel right now versus 10 tons an acre of biomass. All right, now, now we already have algae ponds. We can do this. 
We can't do it at a cost that makes sense yet, but neither can you do cellulosic at a cost that makes sense yet. So both of these things have challenges. Both of them have huge promise. But, but this would be an example of an algae farm that's in place that can grow a very high yield per year of algae. And that's Earthrise in the Imperial Valley. Uh, there's another picture of Earthrise. So the feasibility of algae farming is proven. The scale up for biofuel will be a challenge. Here's another picture of a, a larger farm in Hawaii, Cyanotech. So it's not like algae scale up hasn't happened, but making it cheap enough to burn hasn't happened yet. There's still challenges, of course. So here's another slide from Ron Pate. Basically, there's something estimates in, let's say, $10 to $100 a gallon of oil. We really don't know what it's going to cost to make algae biofuel yet. Uh, clearly, you've got to drive the prices down. It's going to take time, and it's going to take money, to take research. But you've got all these different categories of things that we've got to make progress on. Algae strains, the production systems, do you use photobioreactors, open ponds? How do you deliver the uh, carbon dioxide to the system? How do you locate it with a source of carbon dioxide? Um, you know, how do you, how do you uh, harvest the material, uh, extract, and so forth? And so there's many challenges, and, and each of these has to be worked on individually, and then you have to, of course, put the whole system together with a series of breakthroughs. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I know. I'm, I'm an oceanographer and marine biologist, and, and I was manager at NASA when the sea was, uh, satellite was approved, and that was a really fun two years at NASA. And this is an image of the global distribution of biomass from SeaWiffs. It was the first global representation of terrestrial and ocean biomass ever achieved. It was done by the satellite called SeaWiffs. And, and so if you look at the oceans, you can see high biomass in certain regions, coastal zones, uh, the North Atlantic. And you look, at the, you look at the terrestrial system that we're more familiar with it generally, and you see, okay, North Africa, it's quite barren. Well, here's a region with relatively little biomass, uh, relatively lots of sunshine, and proximity to the sea. So there's regions in the world where there's seawater, sunlight, we're not using the land for other biomass purposes. These could be areas where algae could scale up. Algae produce half of the oxygen, but are less than 1% of the total biomass on Earth. And that's just a simple global argument about their efficiency. And one of the reasons they're efficient is because they don't waste their energy building cellulose. Now, sure, there's a lot of energy in cellulose, but actually that's part of the reason why algae grow so much faster than terrestrial plants is they're not wasting a lot of energy trying to build these complex macromolecules. So um, I encourage us all to figure out how to get the cellulose energy back out for human use, but, but algae, one of their efficiencies is simply because of that. Um, and algae are photosynthetic organisms, and I'm not going to talk in detail about this slide, but basically carbon dioxide, water, light energy, and of course nutrients come in, and you can create these sugars, carbohydrate, oxygen, and these things can go on to other metabolic pathways in the biosynthesis of the cell. And so algae are, are, are plants. Um, they're the forerunners of, of the terrestrial plants that we talk about. Um, they're very diverse as a, taxonomically and genetically, they cover many uh, different phyla, and they range from tiny to, say, giant kelp. Uh, they're efficient, and they're rapid. They can double their biomass in a day or even faster, and I don't think you've ever seen a corn plant or even miscanthus double its biomass in a day. Um, as I mentioned, they produce half the oxygen on Earth, and very few have been studied for their potential, so the strain selection remains uh, an important element of the work to be done. Um, there's also advantages of macroalgae or seaweeds. Uh, they can be maintained at high density. Uh, they'd be easier to maintain in a monoculture. They'd be lower cost to harvest and process, possibly. And they have yields of biomass per area per time, similar to microalgae. So while I'm uh, mostly focused on microalgae, and that's really my main expertise, I mean, algae are just photosynthetic plants, and, and, and there's no reason to exclude macroalgae as an option as well. Um, again, just to reiterate some, some advantages, the algae will use all the nutrients pr provided to them, so downstream eutrophication of our water will be minimized. They, they can use underutilized land. Their yields are 10 times or better, those of land plants. They grow with salt or brackish water. Uh, the non-fuel fraction is high in protein. We could be feeding animals uh, the, the protein eventually, capture CO2 at the point source, and, and they can have high yields of either lipids for biodiesels or starches for these fermentation types of options. So if you look at, um, let's say, algae compared to other sources of lipids for biodiesel, and this is from an NREL report, um, you can see soybeans are down here about 50 
gallons an acre per year of that's, that would be the yield of, of a soybean if you, uh, farm if you were producing uh, lipids from the soybeans or, or vegetable oils and then turning that into biodiesel. Um, algae are, some people say 30,000, okay? I, I put a number about 10% of the extreme because I think 30,000 is unrealistic, but I don't think 3,000 is unrealistic. So, so, you know, as a university scientist, let's say we're doing a consortium, we're trying to envision commercialization, so I think what's the role of the university scientist in the mix? Um, I'd argue, leave us alone and let us be nerds in the lab and play around and build things and we'll use your tax dollars for that. But one of the things I've, I've done is built these nice compact photosynthetic, bio, bio, uh, you know, photosynthetic reactors where I can measure the rate of primary production across this light gradient from low light to high light in a very efficient way with high throughput through the lab. Well, this is the kind of service that the, the algae biomass industry is going to need. They're going to need people that know how to do this. And so we can measure as a function of light the rate of primary production of microalgae. And so this is an example of, of, of data from the ocean. And uh, we also go all over the world, uh, places like Antarctica, and, and use your tax dollars to, uh, you know, have a good time, but also do good science. But the important thing is we've been practicing for many decades, getting ready for this moment to be of use to the uh, algae uh, biomass commercialization sector. Um, we should also be founded in the fundamental principles. There's you can grow algae and lots of people can grow them, throw some nutrients and light and uh, species in, but what's the foundation, what's the governing equations? And so basically primary production is, is simply defined in terms of the absorption coefficient of the algae, absorption of phytoplankton here, times the spectral irradiance or the light, times the quantum yield of photosynthesis. And so if you go in and measure the absorption coefficient, and the primary production and the light, then you can solve for this term, the quantum yield of photosynthesis. So this is sort of the foundation of my own career is trying to really work with this equation, measure the absorption, measure quantum yields. This is sort of total carbon quantum yields. But how the cells partition that energy at the subcellular level also becomes very important, and that's the sort of the next frontier of how do we really look at total energy balance within the cell. So basically, as scientists, we should be looking at the fundamental understanding of biomass yields per area in time and, and helping the, the industry um, uh, understand their systems with respect to actually light absorption and its efficiency of use by the algae. Again, we go to the ocean and we do these kinds of measurements of absorption and photosynthesis of radiance. From those, we can compute things like the quantum yield of photosynthesis. And this is just an example of going out in the California current, doing that kind of work within this gradient of higher chlorophyll to lower chlorophyll off the California coast as, as part of our, our work funded by the National Science Foundation. We also grow algae in the laboratory and do experiments on, on monocultures to see if we can understand them well enough in the light temperature nutrient matrix so that we can actually model their growth. So this is just an example of uh, culture systems in the lab and doing the photosynthesis of radiance uh, with an older incubator system there. And then what we do is we go and take, uh, say, growth rate versus irradiance and plot it for, let's say, two different temperatures. Now, if you take a look at these temperatures, those are pretty low. Minus 1.5 degrees centigrade, that would be freezing point of water. But this is seawater. So what, what you see here at 4 degrees C is that the growth rates here at 4 degrees C of this Antarctic phytoplankton is doubling in two, two and a half days. So even at very low temperatures, algae can still outperform corn, and these light levels are low. So, so midwinter in Canada, we could be growing algae that double in two days or three days. And, and, and I don't think that you're going to find any terrestrial plant that's going to do that. It's something to keep in mind. But the other thing to keep in mind is most of the strains that have been studied have been studied more or less at optimal typical, typical lab temperatures, 15 to 25 degrees centigrade. So most of the strains in isolation that have been studied aren't going to do well at all at 5 or 10 degrees C. They're probably not going to do well at 40 degrees C. So strain selection for these organisms that span that range of temperature growth are very important. These organisms here, if you grow them at 15 degrees C, it kills them. So, but but most, most organisms have been studied only grow 15 to 25 degrees C. So ultimately, as scientists, we want to know, do we understand the system well enough to model it? So here's modeling growth rate and plotting it versus the actual growth rate. So the point is, we dig down deep into the fundamental equations, we measure the fundamental biophysical parameters of photosynthesis, and then we try to challenge our knowledge to see if we can then reproduce 
the, uh, the, the, the growth rates via modeling. And this will all be very important for trying to scale up algae or any other, uh, any other biomass source. We have to be able to really understand the energy throughput and model it, whether it's terrestrial plants or, 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 or algae. Um, I'm going to switch subjects a little bit toward commercialization concepts. This is a slide from General Atomics. Uh, they're uh, just right across the street, just a half a mile away, their headquarters. Um, they have a program that seeks to commercialize algae for biofuels, and they've done a study I listed earlier, a whole lot of challenges, strain selection, harvesting, optimizing the growth, the yields, all sorts of extraction of the material, blah, 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 many challenges. So what they did is they looked at each individual challenge and tried to sort of estimate what fraction how, how much they could improve the current state of the knowledge and how much that would reduce cost. And then they took that sort of fractional reduction of cost somewhere between, let's say, a fraction of zero to one and reducing it from current cost. And then they applied a, what they call a, 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 a Monte Carlo economic model, taking all those components and doing just a, a, a simulation to see what would be the distribution of cost depending on what their fraction of improvement they thought they could do. And so they ran this model and what they basically feel that they can do is, is create biodiesel uh, from algae at less than $2 a gallon. Um, but they haven't divulged the full details of that model because you know, that's sort of their proprietary information and they're trying to run the race and, 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 and try to commercialize this. But the point is that, that they're a fairly sophisticated, you know, applied engineering and, and a company that can scale things up and they're, they feel pretty optimistic that uh, they can, they can uh, get to commercialization. Uh, this is a uh, pond in the backyard of General Atomics here in La Jolla. Uh, it'll, it'll, it's a paddle wheel pond, a small one. Uh, they'll be also doing things at other facilities, and there's quite a few companies that are doing these kinds of tests and experiments around. Um, they've also got these little small outdoor incubators, which I, I, I'm very interested to work more at this scale with students doing basic science instead of trying to do the scale up. But there's a, between the lab and the big open systems will be lots of work at this kind of a scale that's needed. Uh, that's uh, more pictures of the same systems. There's their the raceway pond with uh, algae loaded up and it's the paddle wheel going. And, um, and so, so, so there are companies like General Atomics that are in our area and that are interested in working with the university in sort of this consortium mode. And so we're trying to fi figure out how to nurture that and develop that and continue to put project proposals in one at a time. Eventually, where might you scale up? Well, water's always an issue. Now, this is a distribution of where there is um, um, uh, saline, uh, uh, groundwater and, and the depth. So there's regions like, for example, uh, West Texas and, per and Southeast New Mexico where there's lots of saline groundwater. So, so there is a lot of water underground that's not fresh water. And, and there's also, of course, a lot of seawater in the world. But, but you don't have to be limited to being on the coast to get saline aquifer water. Um, in terms of where you might consider scaling up you know, sooner than later, but this is a region where there's 500,000 acres already engineered with feed water and drainage canals. So if you're going to do algae, you need an area where it's already relatively, you know, the first, first steps would be where it's relatively flat and you've got to put in these delivery systems for water and drainage systems for water if you're going to do algae. It's already ready to go here. Not only that, but they're currently using two and a half million acre feet per year of Colorado River water, fresh water. That has a value of about a billion dollars if it were all reallocated to thirsty San Diegans. Um, of course, the farmers don't necessarily want to do that and make their land have zero value. If we can find a way to create value for the farm land using saline water, salt water, saline aquifers that are in the region or pumping it in from the Gulf of California or whatever, and deliver water into the system that's salt water and grow algae, then the farmers you know, can retain value in the land and this is a billion dollars a year. Um, you know, this is not you know, necessarily getting a venture capitalist to put up $20 billion over 20 years. You could bond that with a revenue bond. So this is thinking economically outside the box. How might you pay for massive scale up? There's potentially $20 billion that could be revenue bonded based on the value of the water. And I think we should be thinking about things like that. Um, we've been in discussions with Sempra Energy Utilities. Uh, their primary, they have a mandate by the state of California to um, 
provide electricity, 5% of the electricity by the year 2017 is mandated by the state of California to be derived from biomass. That's for all electricity sold. So if you go do the calculations, 5%, it's a lot of biomass. And they're looking at the first option to be biogas from you know, anaerobic biodigesters. Now the affluent of these things will be very high in nutrients. And for example, uh, Imperial Valley already has large feedlots, but they also have large nutrient loading problems for the Salton Sea with EPA issues. San Diego already has big EPA issues with our wastewater affluent going offshore. So what are you going to do with a high nutrient affluent? So one of the things we're talking about doing is working with Semper Energy Utilities and the city of San Diego to look at studies with algae on the nutrient-rich affluent coming out of the city of San Diego's wastewater treatment already. They've got anaerobic biodigesters producing three million gallons a day of high nutrient uh, effluent coming out of their anaerobic biodigesters. Why not put the most efficient plants on earth in that water and see if we can capture those nutrients, help the city out, help Sempra capture CO2 from the turbines that are operating there, deliver that to the algae, grow the biomass and put it in a very efficient and inexpensive way upstream back into the anaerobic biodigester. Now this becomes a, an algae problem that's actually simpler than trying to optimize the yield of some superbug for lipids. This is just create biomass as fast as possible. There's no doubt algae can grow faster than any terrestrial plant. And so this is a potential application that a lot of people think that doing these kinds of services would be an early access point for, for algae scaling up. So we're looking at part of the you know, one of the projects we're trying to develop within this consortium concept is can the university work with the city and local industry? We all have these needs, we have some knowledge, we have some ideas, can we make this work? So, in, in, in coming to, to a conclusion then, um, regardless of, of what kind of biology you're doing, whether you're doing, you know, using heterotrophic microorganisms to take organic matter and convert it, or whether you're taking photosynthetic microorganisms or you're growing miscanthus and trying to process it, fundamentally there's this biology thing in there. And, and, and biology is ultimately linked to the genetics that scales up to the organisms their physiology. And eventually we need to create systems where, where we're, we're optimizing systems to take advantage of what's going on in biology to do what we want to do, in this case, say, create biofuels. So this is an idea not just for algae, but this is for a bioenergy project overview. What we can do in, you know, in regions like San Diego where we have a lot of biology expertise and, and, a, and I think a community that's interested. Um, of course, there needs to be engineering integrated to this and, and then of course financing and economics if you're going to try to scale it up. And, and we need to be pushing from the lab scale where we are now up to pilot scale and these are happening in algae as well as with uh, say terrestrial uh, fuel crops, non-food crops, but eventually we need to be going to the, the larger scale. So this process from the lab scale up to the fuel scale is obviously a big challenge. There's a lot of money in here to, to, to get there and a lot of knowledge has got to be captured and integrated in, in systems way. Um, among the things we may be able to do is help with uh, wastewater remediation, for example, and CO2 capture in wastewater and, and come back out here with, with fuel. Uh, or food uh, protein for animals and so forth. So the idea then is how do we take the, the basic knowledge in the universities that where we're experts in this and maybe some of the engineering experts and how do we push this out so that we start to move along here into a, an applied system. And, and, and so we really need policy to encourage the early high risk investment in the private sector and I think we need to have regional centers of excellence where the, the public, private, and academic partnerships are sufficiently large and, and sufficiently um, integrating the, the potential elements for synergy that we can uh, make some progress. And, and so what might a center be and who might be involved? So these are sort of I individual groups we're speaking with now in the San Diego region. I've mentioned some of these names here. Uh, in San Diego, we're in, in, in dialogues with the, some of the national laboratories. San Diego State probably should be listed here as well, but for right now I'm at UCSD, the J. Craig Venter Institute, the Scripps Research Institute. So you got these nonprofits, university research doing basic research. You got applied research in the public labs or in the city, wastewater, let's say. And eventually we want to create systems that are c competitive in the, in, in the economic realm in the private industry. And funding can come from grants, gifts, or private equity, but how does that flow through? How do you manage it? These are big challenges. And I'm not saying I have any answers. I'm saying we have these challenges. 
And I'd like to see San Diego, UCSD, and the public and private sector come together in, in this way. Thank you very much. Okay, so what I wanted to talk to you um, about today, so first to, to, to give a little bit of my opinions on LG2, and then also show you some of the things that we've started to do to develop some of the molecular tools um, that I think will be essential to getting uh, algae into its correct place at the apex of the biofuel pyramid. <laughs> okay, so first of all, what is algae? It's, that's actually Latin for seaweed, right? So it's an aquatic eukaryotic organism um, that contains chlorophyll and other pigments and can carry out photosynthesis. Um, and these, as Greg already said, these range from microscopic single cells to very large multicellular organisms, the seaweed that we see in the ocean, and they're generally, they're further categorized to brown algae, red algae, green algae, and then also the dinoflagellates and diatoms. And it's actually some of the diatoms that really produce the very high uh, lipid contents. Now, many people um, sort of mix in cyanobacteria and call them blue-green algae. And we want to promote diversity, of course, in our algal community, so we'll accept those photosynthetic <laughs> microorganisms, even though they are not really algae. Okay, so why algae is, is a biofuel platform? It really comes down to just a couple things. It's, it's the potential to, to have an economically uh, viable biofuel. And then importantly, I think it, it's, the, it's the chance to go to scales that we really need to reach if we're going to impact you know, the, the fuel consumption and the energy needs of this country and the world. And then sustainability, and by sustainability, that simply means non-competition with, with food crops. And I think algae at least has the potential for all of those, and I'll talk about some of them. So just a few numbers to consider. I know you guys have already seen these many times already, but so that we, in this country, we consume 140 billion gallons per year of liquid fuels. And algae can produce, at the, at the very best guys out in the literature, 50 tons of biomass per acre per year. And you know, Greg put that at, at 3,000. I've seen other people say that's about 1,600 gallons per year of, of fuel. So at, at that rate, you would need 90 million acres would be needed to fill the liquid fuel requirements of this country. And theoretically, we could reduce that fourfold, so get down to something on the order of 25 million acres if we hit our maximum photosynthetic yield. And just to put that into perspective, right now, this year, I think we'll have 90 million acres of corn and 67 million acres of soybean. And the cost of production, which is very tough to estimate right now, is something between $3 and $60 a gallon. And the reason that big spread is that, that if you ask the people who really grow algae at scale now, which are the groups that grow it for nutraceuticals at that 100 to 200 acre plot size, they're at, at something resembling $60 per gallon. But the theoretically, if you, you know, what we can produce in the lab, if we could extrapolate that out, that might be the $3. So I think we're much closer to the $60 per gallon right now. Although I heard an alarming number um, when I was at NREL last week, which is the cost of gasoline delivered in Afghanistan is $130 a gallon. So already we're at half that, and we could be successful if we were there. <laughs> OK, so this is a slide I put in. Um, this is actually uh, for those people who, who talk about corn producing to ethanol. But I think the argument is the same, and that's that you can't have this perpetual motion machine, which is the reason we have cheap food in this country right now and worldwide is because we have cheap energy. We, we, you know, as discussed earlier this morning, we produce a huge amount of nitrogen fertilizers from cheap fossil fuels and put those onto our crops to reach the yields we're at. Well, you can't take cheap food and turn it into biofuel and have that biofuel be the cheap energy to keep growing them. Okay? So, so that is simply to point out that although we look at these costs now and we, you know, we say, well, can you get to $3 or $4 a gallon? That may not be reality. Reality may be something at $10 a gallon or even higher than that to be economically viable um, when the day comes, and that may not be too far away. OK, so what should an algal biofuel uh, solution look like? Well, in, in my mind, it should be sunlight energy converted directly to a fuel. So the closer we get to photosynthesis, I think, the better it is. The more economic sense it makes and the more biological sense it makes. We shouldn't be using agricultural land or taking sugar and, and fermenting them into uh, to biofuels is something that, that has to be a transition at the best and just cannot be sustainable. And we need a highly scalable process to meet the demand. Eventually, we're going to have to meet commodity energy prices, and it would be great if it's carbon neutral. And I think algae at least has the potential for all of those things. So obviously, sunlight is the original source uh, of all liquid fuels. So the, the, the oil we pump out of the ground is simply algae that grew many million years ago and was covered up and went into nice 
um, non-oxygenic conditions. Um, the, the little red circles, so, so this is simply the solar irradiance on, on the planet, and I think as you can see, um, there's lots of the world, gets a lot of sunlight, and algae would be very well to be grown there. Uh, the little red circles are places that I know of where algae is produced at some scale, at least in the 100 to 200 acres. Okay, so, so this is, is worldwide. And obviously, if we could exploit the ocean in some ways to grow these things, then I think the land issue simply becomes uh, moot, it just no, no longer in the equation. So what are the challenges we have uh, for, for producing an uh, algal biofuel? And I think Greg already covered these. In my mind, um, the, the most expensive part of algae, it's a algae are easy to grow. The oceans are full of them. If we had a way to cheaply harvest all of the algae that is growing in the oceans right now, our biofuel problems would be solved. But we don't, and the reason we don't is because they grow at relatively low density and they're dispersed, and so you have to move around a lot of water. Even once we harvest them, it's relatively tough right now to recover the biofuels out of them, okay? The last thing we need to do is we need to identify strains and improve those, and what those little arrows are to indicate is that like any crop that we grow, it's the iterative cycles between those three things that get us to an economically viable position, meaning that we have to, I believe, that we have to identify superior algae, and then we have to adapt or domesticate those algae to our harvesting and industrial technology so we can bring these things to be economically viable. Okay, so what biofuels could you produce in algae? I think, you know, a lot of people think that, that biodiesel um, is, is what algae produce, and it's true they make a lot of triglycerides and they make fatty acids, and we can certainly squeeze those out of them and get biodiesel from them. Um, some algae produce fantastic lipids and large, large long chain hydrocarbons. Uh, the most famous one is, is from Botryococcus. It's, it's a very long chain, um, 35 carbons, if I'm not wrong, um, which burns perfectly well, and that's actually secreted from the organism. But we can also, as Greg said, think about algae for carbohydrates, sh sugars and starches, ethanols or other alcohols, or even cellulose or just plain biomass. So I think there are many opportunities, and I think the top few are simply the ones that probably today have are the most economically viable if we could pull those off. Okay, so guesses about, the re about how we realize biofuel production in algae. And the reason that says guesses, you can see at the bottom, that's to predict without uh, sufficient information, which is certainly what we're doing in algae right now. Okay, so what we're doing is we're taking what we know in the lab and attempting to extrapolate those out. But it, it, this is just opinion. It's my idea that we have to identify strains with the desired traits, and those desired traits have to be both the biofuel they're producing as well as an ability to grow these things at high density and harvest them in an, in an inexpensive manner and recover that fuel. And I think that it's unlikely that any strain um, is going to have everything we want, right? I, I, I think algae are out there in the world being little survivors, and the ones that grow fast, which are the ones that will outcompete the other organisms, tend not to put their money in the bank, meaning they don't accumulate, you know, the, the rich molecules that we want to burn as fuels. Those are the, you know, those are the ones that kind of grow slow. So we are going to have to adapt these things, and we're going to need to modify these strains to produce the high levels of the desired molecules we want, and mainly to fit our harvesting and fuel recover, recovery requirements. And, and as I said, that's probably not naturally occurring. This is something we're going to have to do. So this will require genetic modification, but I think we have to do genetic modification on an accelerated time frame. And what I mean by this, you know, not, not, to, not to be too cynical, but... Um, so we need to accelerate the time frame of the domestication of algae. So this is something that we have simply not approached at all as a society, right? There are a few algae that are produced for nutraceuticals. There are some that are grown worldwide and eaten as food. But by and large, if we look at corn, just in as an example, right, that, that was first domesticated 6,000 years ago, right? And when the steel plow was introduced by John Deere, which was, you know, more than 150 years ago, that allowed us to at least go to large-scale production Corn varieties were available more than 140 years ago, right? And then the Green Revolution started in 1944, and finally genetically modified corn came in 2000. So I think we need, we need to do the same things for algae, but we simply cannot afford that same time frame, so we have to accelerate that in some ways. But I think we have the tools available to do that, all right? And I think the first thing we need is a, it's, it's a much bigger and better knowledge base of algae. We have simply ignored these wonderful little species for way too long. Um, I, I know Chris said the other night, Somerville, and I'm certain he's right on this, that the budget for research in plant biology is probably 1% that of NIH. Well, I can assure you that the budget for algal research is 1% of that of plants, right? 
And, and, and I just don't understand how that happened, but it did, but we're going to reform that. Okay, so we need to identify characteristics from a large number of diverse algal species, and this is both genomics, proteomics, metabolic profiling. There, there, there are wonderful molecules that are being made out there, and we have to go out and discover what those are. We have to find the genes that are responsible for those and the way to regulate those guys. We certainly need to improve the genetic tools. There, there is no algae breeding right now, um, and that's something we have to work on. And then I think that we have the opportunity now to develop the molecular genetic tools for engineering, and I think that will allow us to essentially accelerate the rate at which we do domestication of algae to get where we are. And then a very important one, and I won't talk about this at all today, is we need to develop the agricultural practices for algal growth, harvesting, and processing. We need to industrialize algae the same way we have industrialized foods in this country. All right, so what do we have so far? We, we at least have achieved some things in algae in spite of our very modest budgets. Okay, so we have many species that have been identified and limited characterization of those, but even in that limited characterization, we see fantastic potential. So there's some wonderful biofuels that are made in algaes. Okay, we know how to grow, grow algae at modest scale, meaning we can take it up to the 100 or 200 acre uh, level, and we've been successful with that, right? We have a few algal genomes sequenced and annotated, Chlamydomonas reinhardi, the, the, the farthest along, and I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. And then we have nuclear and chloroplast transformation. So we have many things in place to do some things. And I think what, what our challenge is going to be, as I said, is not the simple engineering of this, but it's understanding of the biology of the system so that we can turn these things on at the right place at the right time. That's when we'll have economic viability of this system. Okay, so I, I just wanted to end. Um, with a, a sort of a practical approach on how uh, we imagine that algae could impact biofuels from a different side. And that is that as, as I was looking at these numbers uh, a year or so ago, 140 billion gallons per year of liquid fuel are consumed in the U.S. And we have a mandate to get that to what, 14 billion gallons by 2012 and 36 billion gallons of ethanol by 2022. And it requires about 100 grams of cellulase per gallon of ethanol produced. So within the next few years, if we really are going to achieve 10% of fuel of ethanol, that's going to require 1.4 billion kilograms of cellulase produced. And a billion kilograms of enzymes made in bacteria would be about 100 billion liters of fermentation. And those numbers, you know, as overwhelming as they are, seem to me might give an opportunity for algae to participate in uh, the cellulose to ethanol um, arena. So why would we engineer algae to produce cellulase degrading enzymes in algae? So what, the, the sort of arguments go like this. Production of cellulase has, has to be at agricultural cost and scale is the only way to achieve economic productions. And obviously you've heard many talks here um, in, in the last day saying that this is one of the bottlenecks of, of cellulose production. It seems to me, from my experience in, in trying to produce pharmaceutical proteins, that capex of fermentation, at least as we know it right now, will preclude its use at this scale and cost. That nobody will make the investment to make the fermenters that are going to grow 1.4 billion kilograms of enzyme that you are going to attempt to sell at 0.2 cents per gram. So antibodies sell about $10,000 a gram. So there's simply no economic drivers for this, but I thought, you know, there, there's a chance that algae could impact this, mainly because we know that algae can be grown at agricultural scale and at cost approaching agricultural commodities, and we thought that algae could be engineered to, redu to produce recombinant cellulases. Um, and then I'll just show at the end, and then we also thought that it, that it may well be that it's not the products uh, of, of, of algae can't be the cellulase, the primary product may have to be something else, biodiesel or animal feed, and the cellulases may have to be a byproduct that you're simply throwing off very inexpensively. With the idea being that biofuel production from algae in the end may end up looking something like this. You, you have a bioreactor, and I, it, it's unlikely that it'll be a closed system. It's going to have to be open at, at the volume we're going to go to. But what you may end up with is having an algae down in here in which you have municipal wastewater or waste carbon dioxide coming in for the nutrient inputs into this. You have cellulases that you're extracting out or other industrial enzymes that, that you know, may, may be an economic driving force for this. You're extracting the, the lipids out of the algae for the biofuel and then the protein is heading off to, to feed fish or to feed other animals. And only if you sort of, you know, I think in the pork industry they say we sell everything but the oink, right? So I think in algae what we're going to have to do is 
you know, s sell everything, including the oink of these guys, and, and perhaps then we have a chance to have economic viability. Okay, so where do we go from here? So uh, let me just reiterate one thing Greg said. So I think we need a national center for algal research, and I don't see any reason that, that should not be here in San Diego. I, 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 I am personally offended by the idea that we get only 0.01% of what NIH gets. Right? I, I think algae are more important than that and deserve better. And I think they deserve better here in San Diego. Um, we certainly need to develop the knowledge base for algae, meaning we need to invest in the genomics and the proteomics and the metagenomics and the rest of this on algae the way we have in all the other organisms that are out there in the world. We certainly need to continue to develop the molecular tools to make algae a nice biotechnology platform. Obviously, the one advantage in my mind that I really see in this is if we could ever come close to producing cellulases at 0.2 cents a gram, then we have solved the problem for all the industrial enzymes that the rest of the world needs, right? So there are some fantastic biotechnology spin-offs of this. Um, we need to develop the strains for algae that, that, that will give us economic biofuel production. I think that will take some genetics, some genetic engineering. That will take strain selection, optimization of photosynthesis. And we need to, in, to, to develop the industrial practices for growth and harvest of these things.